This might be just as good as the Milwaukee. Who knows, right? We don't know until we take it apart. That's what I'm gonna do. We've got the actual air impulse system apart, and wow! There are some novel and interesting designs going on in here. Here's the piss. Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop today. The Cryobi Brad Nailer. A Ryobi brand, of course, uh, Japanese right now. It ain't Japanese. It's licensed to uh, Tektronix Industries of Hong Kong. Same guys that make Milfucky and Sears stuff as well as the house brand for the homeless despot, Rigid. Now, in my opinion, this is the trailing edge. Maybe not even, doesn't even make the cut for the prosumer grade of tools, which of course is a uh, a marketing wanker word. Uh, it's almost like these guys just sit around making up new words. And no, the irony is not lost on me. I have absolutely no Ryobi tools other than a laser range finder, which I bought, but it had the battery with it. This, you have to have the batteries for it, so it's almost like you have to buy, uh, yeah, you have to stock your whole shop with this style, I guess, because uh, the batteries come separately. So I sat there at the homeless despot debating whether or not I should buy 175 bucks worth of eight gang charger batteries and two battery packs, or whether I should spend 100 Canadian pesos, get uh, an impact driver and a thing with the twirly bit with baterias. So I, I figured it's a no brainer, but now I get it home. I don't know if these are NICAD or lithium ion. Big difference in performance, of course. Oh, there we go. It's a simple matter of just reading the box. We're not doing these today though, we're just gonna steal the batteries out of these. A four, we're gonna take this A part because I have no fucking clue how it works. It's got apparently no cords or nothing and it uses air to drive uh, spiky bits into, yeah, wood. We're not even into the inwards totally and already getting <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Lots of chuckles out of this. RyobiTools.com nation, of course, the marketing wankers tap into our innate sense of tribalism and try and sell us more crap because we're, we're very alienated from each other. There's no clubs anymore. There's no, so basically ones and zeros beaming into your head through the internet are how they reach you now. Look at this. Receive how-to instructions from celebrity bloggers. Uh, I'll show you what for, how to. There we got the instructions, pretty ganky, which is fine because we're gonna throw them out anyway. Read the instructions, that's like cheating. The instructions a lot of times are pretty much just ass covering on their behalf. You can see we already have an errata. If the LED lights go out on your nailer, the unit has timed out for your protection. <laughs> just doesn't end. So the parent company of this Ryobi, actually this is licensed just like the rigid name uh, from a Japanese company and the rigid name of course from an American company and then they outright, this TTI Industries uh, based out of Hong Kong, outright owns the Milwaukee brand and the AEG brand. So they're very similar. If you own a whole bunch of brands, are you going to hire engineers for each brand? No, 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 no. They're all designed in the same place. They're all manufactured in the same place. So. It, it becomes a, just a marketing thing where, okay, we want to hit the low market, we want to hit the prosumer, and we want to hit the higher end prosumer, which is what Milwaukee is. Used to be super contractor grade, and it's just not the same. They bought the brand, Milwaukee brand, in 2006, and they've essentially mined it for uh, lots of money. If you look at their stock, it's just gone through the roof, even in tough economic times. Unfortunately, it ain't half the tool, the Milwaukee anyway, ain't half the tool it used to be. Now, I might be succumbing to the marketing wank that this is not a prosumer tool. This might be just as good as the Milwaukee. Who knows, right? We don't know until we take it apart. That's what I'm gonna do. Now to me, it looks and feels kinda jinky, like a grown up version of a transformer. If you look at the, the three brands that these guys sell, and Ryobi is only available at the Home Depot, same as Rigid. So something going on there. And then the Rigid, they say lifetime guarantee. This is guaranteed for life, you bring it into the whole blah, blah, blah. 
that's total bullshit because what happens is you bring it into the Home Depot if it's failed, even if the battery's failed, and the Home Depot says, no, 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 no. You gotta send it back to rigid. Now, a drill is gonna cost you 200 bucks. Well, it's gonna cost you 100 bucks to ship it back to rigid. Are you gonna do that? No, fuck no, you're gonna buy a new drill. That's how they get you on that one. And on this one, I think they're, they're targeting the guys that want the tool, but want the cheapest tool possible. You know, other than the Princess Auto Power Fister, or <laughs> in the States, the Horrible Freight, uh, I think it's Pittsburgh or something, you know, super duper, super duper Pittsburgh brand, uh, made in Guangzhou, China, of course, what all of these are. All right, here we have a review of the Ryobi 18 gauge on, you know, one of the usual suspects, about dot home. And as you can see, they're making money off their ad revenue. Uh, they're probably getting the tool for free to review they're also trying to sell it here if you click on one of these buttons and you buy it from amazon these guys get a commission so people ask me uh when i do a video hey where did you buy that blah 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 i don't like doing that it, you can find it yourself i'm not you know i just ain't in that game so what happens is ryobi will send this guy a tool to review he'll review it uh he'll either get paid for it or even if he doesn't get paid, there's the expectation that as long as the review is fairly decent, you'll never see a review that gets one out of five stars. The expectation is that they'll send more tools from their other brands. Now remember, this company owns the three big brands other than DeWilt. So if you're in the review business, do not piss these guys off. Unless you're me, because I got a job. I don't give a fuck. So here we go. Expert. Chris Baylor experience started at the age of he was born at a very early age let's see let's see here using okay conclusion all in all I was duly impressed with the Ryobi P320 cordless brad nailer the tool <laughs> the tool has a very solid feel in the hand yeah confirmed woodworker now to give you context tools is big business man Four point something, four point five billion. That's a thousand million. Four point five billion in tools. They sold this one company sold in one annum. It's incredible, huge, and also places like the homeless despot. You'll notice if you if you look at the shelf space, Ryobi. I mean, Dewalt and Milwaukee or uh, Makita are there, but overall the shelf space is mainly these guys and. Homeless Despot doesn't pay for the tools, hey? They don't pay for the tools. It's on consignment. They put the tools on the shelf. When they sell, they get the profit. Now, at first blush, the plastic is pretty chintzy. Might be a nylon, might be polyamid. I, I doubt it. But it's not, if you listen to it, it is not glass fiber reinforced, which, of course, all the prosumer tools are, the DeWilts and the Milfockies. Also the trigger switch, the snap action on the trigger switch, that spring that actually gets the contacts to hit, uh, pretty anemic. And then it's over molded. So this is an interesting process where they'll have a rotary mold, they'll injection mold the plastic in and then turn it over to a different mold in the same uh, station essentially, and then inject in this butylene kind of rubber compound. And this is the stuff of course, that starts to stink and degrade if it comes in contact with any kind of solvent. It smells like a human vomit, the butylene compound. And the trigger switch itself, the plastic is, feels like ABS. Craptacular. I have a request. Now just for tits and fiddles, if you're gonna make your own teardown videos, for the love of all that is good and holy, please omit the disassembly. Lefty loosey righty tighty, we get it unless you're in the southern hemisphere, but there's no accounting for Austrians. I mean sacker torts and kangaroos. Who here's a selector knob off the back. I don't know what it does, but when we put it back together, we'll figure it out. And we see some markings here. PA PA6, so that's nylon. And it's glass fiber reinforced 15. So 15%. Normally we see 30%. But I wouldn't I guess. I guess glass fiber is expensive and they go with half the amount. So that's why you can't hear it. 
as much. It doesn't sound the same when you cut it because you're not cutting through as many glass fibers. Oh, and of course, we have little strings of uh, hot glue. Just a finishing touch. However, it was UL, Canadian and US uh, listed, so it's not Intertech. It's not one of those cut rate. So I appear to have all the fasteners out and gave her a proper massage, but the clamshell eh, does not want to give up the goods. As we all know, sometimes some clams need a little extra massage. Might be the sticker. There we are. There we are. Here we are. Shada! There is a surprising amount of crap going on in there. Totally, did I cut some major corners on this one? I'm going to show you. Of course, the trigger switches is where the rubber meets the road on these tools. That's where the, the 200 pound gorilla meets the electricity. Uh, I'm going to show you this here. It's, yeah, shocking. Focus, you mother. One thing I've never been accused of is knowing what the hell I'm doing when it comes to a camera. And today is no different. I just got in too close. But anyway, so we'll zoom out a little bit. You know, look at this. So the anemic switch there. Oh, that. Oh, shit. Well, that's it. The jig is up. We're fucked. So the reason that switch was so anemic is because it's got an external spring. It's not even a trigger switch. It's just a little micro switch. Oh, my dear Lord. Look at this. And the snap action, well, when you're applying on this tiny little dot there, it, uh, yeah, it feels okay. But, you know, when you got the old meat hook abortion going, it doesn't feel so nice. So this is a nice touch. They put some dielectric grease on there. It's actually full of schmoo. Uh, that keeps the green death down. It keeps the contacts uh, in contact. It keeps the corrosion down, even though this is uh, nickel plated. But anyway, uh, maybe tin plated. Just a chintzy little tactile switch. Oh, come on, camera. You're not even try-harding. Now, behind this little switch with the spring of a thing, I'm assuming this switch is what for putting five nails through your kneecap instead of just the one. You know, the semi-auto versus auto. But here's the board. And dun, dun, dun. Illuminati confirmed. TTI. Right? But the most important part... Look at this little crappy tactile switch. And it's even actuated on a big old lever. So, 200 pound gorilla. Yeah, man, oh man. She ain't gonna last. Here we got the inwards, outwards. And th despite this being polyamide with 15% uh, glass fiber, this is ABS straight up. And then the gummy grippy soft bits are TPS. So that's a butylene. And uh, SEBS, S-E-B-S. I, uh, I just looked this up. It's an interesting compound, actually. Styrene on one end, then the butylene rubber, and then styrene on the other end. The styrene, of course, is uh, plastic cutlery, so it's hard. So it, it has better, apparently, better thermal resistance and a little bit better uh, mechanical, say, abrasion resistance than just the straight-up butylene. So that's that overmold compound. I'm just gonna pull off what I asked you me to be the hammer and reservoir section. So that would be pressurized with air. You can see some small Buna in O-rings, a larger one here. Uh, UHMW plastic backing, and uh, it's epo there's some epoxy injected in there too. I don't know what that is for. Bizarre. Maybe there's some components in there. Must, the hammer must be in here. Oh. Oh. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Oh yeah. So this is the hammer that actually pounds in the nails here. The ubiquitous Chinese factory writing. The penmanship. Uh, yeah, you can tell some Chinese guy yeah, put this together. It's very telling in the fives, actually. It's a cultural thing. I don't know if they make their fives that way. Just an interesting anecdote. Or not. 
Well, let's take an intermission here. I waffled on long enough about the commercial side, but it's important to me to learn how things work. And part of how things work is the commercial side. Now, fellow machining channel, Double Boost has allowed me to use some of this footage here. It's amazing footage. I'm not a big vehicle guy, but this is a work vehicle from 1929. Steam powered, you, it just oozes torque. And Double Boost is one of my favorite channels because you get to go into John's shop and hang out with him. I haven't quite determined if he's a Yorkshireman <laughs> or a Jordy boy. Either way, he's a YI man par excellence. And this is the awesome part of YouTube is you don't get to hang out in a shop a half a world away. You get to see how somebody else works, how somebody else talks, and have a laugh. It's, you know, it's great. So check out Double Boost's channel. We've got the actual air impulse system A part and wow! There are some novel and interesting designs going on in here. Here's the piston itself. You can even see it's got skirting just like a just like a real piston. And here's the pin. It's actually got some magnetic retention in there. Of course, this is just UHMW, ultra high molecular weight plastic. But as you can see here, we've got what looks to be a little puck of Dellerin because you can't have this neodymium magnet. Check this out, check this out. And it's a powerful, that's got to be an N52. Powerful. But you can't have that bearing on the, uh, on the, the side of the receptacle here. Now this isn't actually a uh, receiver, air receiver at all. It's actually a, a cylinder because we don't pressurize, and we don't maintain any pressure in this when it's not striking. I'll get into that momentarily. And it's loaded right full of silicon lube, uh, silicone rather. So if you take this apart, uh, you're going to want to get some specialty solvent in order to clean up the silicone. Because if you ever paint, if you ever want to paint something ever again, uh, silicone is your enemy. Now having a look at this and feeling it a little more, uh, despite the layer of schmoo on there, it's far too stiff for UHMW. And it's even... I'd be surprised if this is PP, poly, polypropylene. Um, I bet you it's Deleron. We'll just try and see. A, it's, it's injection molded. I can't see. Oh, there we go. Yeah, POM. So that's uh, polyzymethyl something something. Deleron is the trade name. Um, there's lots of trade names. So this is exceptionally stiff and self-lubricating. So that's a perfect choice for something that's got to chooch back and forth real fast in a anodized aluminum cylinder. Now this hasn't been honed at all and you can see there's some nasty bits in there but that's just part and parcel of it being cheap, cheaply made, as cheaply made as possible. However, home gamer, you know, how much, what kind of life are you expecting out of this? 
it'll probably be just fine because the silicone lube doesn't go anywhere and then Buna and O-ring you know you're not going to wear out the Delarin to any extent so you might need to replace this O-ring if it starts getting weak on you but yeah in this case you get what you pay for so here's the here's the piston and this is really interesting because it doesn't seem like it's going to come out this is what actually strikes here you can see the the pokey bit end there for the whacking of the fastener but I can't get that out luckily I got just the tool for the jab oh there we go and this is also magnetized so when it pops back in there and there's a there's a wear ring on here and that is just a plastic wear ring it's not phenolic or anything and behind that is an o-ring so that's interesting I've never seen an o-ring behind a wear ring like that but you're not too too worried about some minor leakage because we're flowing a, a whole lot of air and uh, it's not pressurized for any amount of time. We're basically just giving this the impetus to drive that nail right through your, you know, foot or finger, or what have you. And since your flesh is only rated for 20 MPA, you know, 3,000 psi, really doesn't take much to drive that nail through you. Even if it hits a bone, I mean, 75 MPA. What's that? That's 11,000 psi you are literally the softest thing in the shop softer than any plastic so just uh, just be kind to yourself yeah rod goes in oh there we go it got pulled in by that magnet so that's the detent now this is a mystery to me why they would fill this with an epoxy that's a counter I don't know I have no idea maybe this is a feature from another tool and they don't use it, so they have to fill it full of epoxy. But it is a machine that's done this. This wasn't done by hand. And you can see from these little fill tits here. Apologize. Pips. P-I-T-S. Not tits. T-I-T-S. And again, this is just an extruded aluminum section here. Not honed or anything. It's been anodized, so rougher as shit. Um, Going to wear out the O-ring in, in short order. But this is, this is home gamer tool. So if you know that... You could fix that O-ring, no problem. I mean, O-rings are jelly bean parts. You buy them off Alibaba or whatever. You know. And now this actually feels like a different material than the Pistone. So if I can find some marks here. Yeah, there we go. Oh, inter oh yeah, interesting. So this is polypropylene PP-MD20. So this is mineral filled. I would assume this would be a talc which is a very soft uh, platelet kind of mineral. But what that does in plastic is it uh, increases its tensile modulus uh, of brackets of elasticity. So it makes it more rigid. Actually, at, at 20, this MD20, at 20%, that doubles the uh, rigidity from, from like a thousand, whatever it is, a thousand apples to 2,000 apples or metric, I guess it'd be... Uh, MPA. Who'd have thunk it a hundred years ago that dinosaur squeezings would be so ubiquitous and complicated? But as an engineering material, it's marvelous. Initially, I thought the neodymium magnet on here was for retention, to retain it in this wrist. It is actually to tell the confuser what's going on with the pistone, so it doesn't trigger too often. You know, pop, 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 pop. These would be Hall effect sensors, and when you wipe them with a magnetic field, they send a signal to the little computer down here to tell the computer where it's located. Interesting. Turn off and on the motor, uh, disengage the trigger, or engage the trigger, or you know, whatever the computer is doing. But that's what's telling it the location of this pistone. Now we're going to have a look at this motor momentarily. I got some numbers off it, but uh, you can see here, this is the gearbox section. I initially thought that this was the compressor section and that this was a reservoir, but that's not the case at all. This does not hold any pressure when it's not chooching. So it's only when you pull the trigger and it gives a, gives a go that the impetus fires up. So this, this whole section 
is all gear reduction. And if you look at the length, the throw of this crank, it's just incredibly long. And that makes sense because this cylinder is incredibly long. So we have to move this the whole length for one rotation of this. That's the deep reduction. And of course this probably spins like a motherfucker. I bet you it's 30,000 ripples. So we're just going to find out what the gear reduction, the total gear reduction is of this stacked planetary gear set. There's probably like five or six reductions in there. And the way we do that, of course, is we mark the fan on the motor and then we mark the output shaft and we just uh, turn it and count. Wow, this is taking forever. Three. Four. So we're at four rotations on the motor and it moved about a red one. I'm going to be here all day doing this, but hey, anything for the cause, am I right? All right, I just had my lunch and I took the time to look up this motor. It does have a number on the back of it, permanent magnet, and brush, a carbon brush DC motor. It's an RS775WC9013, which is a Mabuchi carbon brush motor. Uh, famous Japanese brand for motors. A good motor. 2100. I was a little off on my ripem estimate. 21,000 rather ripems. 2.8 amps no load. It'll do something like 29 at full efficiency. At stall, this thing will draw 156 amps. So uh, it wouldn't take long to roast this right out of the cheap plastic, cheap ABS enclosure. But the interesting thing is, it's 300 watts this will put out. That's, that's a fair bit of wattage there for, for this little motor. I set to turn in the fan, and it's funny, the fan is actually omnidirect or uh, bi-directional, whereas this would only be turning in the one direction. Uh, you know, there's no river, you can't pull the... You can't pull the nails out with it. So it only needs to turn in one direction. I turned it 12 times and this went about an eighth of a turn. And that was close enough for the girls I go out with. That gives us a ratio of 96 to 1. Right? 12 times 8. Now I also found on the spec sheet at maximum efficiency the torque that this puts out which is 1560 grams per centimeter. Grant no grams centimeter. My mistake which uh, is equivalent to 1.35 inch pound. So just as a mental exercise, what for keeping the gray matter plastique, we're gonna go ahead and dead reckon what kind of pressures we would expect to see in here. And just dead reckoning gives you an idea of how well it's built and how well it needs to be built in order to withstand the, the forces that uh, this, this tool puts out. Okay, so we start off, we know from the data sheet that this will put out at maximum efficiency, it'll put out uh, 1,560 grams centimeters, which uh, I already changed it over, it's 1.35 inch pounds. Okay, so that's our baseline, we got that right off the data sheet. Now, what we didn't get off the data sheet was the gear ratio, which is 96 to 1. So we take that pounds, feet, multiplied by 96, uh, 1.35 divided by uh, times, well, 100 essentially. So that'll give us right around 130 pounds, 60 kilos. So this assembly is going to have the minimum oomph, that's the technical term, minimum oomph when this arm is at 90 degrees. This output crank is at 90 degrees. So we're going to take this put it at 90 degrees yeah that at 90 degrees here this is putting out 60 kilos and at 90 degrees it'll be the lowest it'll put out so we're going to go with that case so we measure the pistona here and that is um three quarter two and three quarter so the radius of that god bless the ins system is uh, one and three eighths just double the denominator right so that's 1.375 square that times pi square that so that's uh, less than two uh, we will just go two and then we'll take it off the tail end so 
2 square inches times pi is, now we'll say 6. 130 divided by 130 pounds divided by 6 square inches gives us in here 21 pounds per square inch. 22. 20, yeah, 20, oh no, 20, yeah, 21 square in, pounds per square inch. Okay, so that's what's in here. So that's what's acting on this. And remember, this is magnetically, ooh, magnetically retained. So it has to build some pressure and quite a bit, surprisingly, in order to get this to unseat. Okay, so if we got 21 pounds per square inch, and we have a bore of one and one and three sixteenths. That's uh, one point one eight seven five, right? Half of that is six hundred thou. Uh, square the six hundred thou times pi. That'd be point three point three six times pi. Well, a third of pi, so one, 1.3 square inches. You follow me? 1.3 square inches now times that 21 pounds that we got from this calculation gives us right around 30 pounds that it's going to be acting on here. Now you say to yourself, whoa, hold on here. I can't take an 18 penny or a 18 gauge brad nail push 30 pounds with my thumb and plunk it into a piece of wood. It just ain't gonna happen. You're full of shit, it's not 30 pounds. This thing is actually moving, right? So it's accelerating and uh, we have to take into consideration the energy that is input into this because this is a weight and you can see this is all steel uh, for good reason because you want a little bit of meat in there in order to accelerate this, have some energy stored before it strikes the nail. So anyway, suffice it to say, you know, not accurate. However, it gets you within the range of knowing sort of how this thing has to be built in order to withstand the forces that you would expect plus minus, you know, 50%, something like that. But it gets you within an order of magnitude just to, it, just so you know. Of course, it's going to be just like an engine where the PV curve goes up, yeah, and then comes back down and there's some, anyway, look up PV curve and you'll see exactly the kind of pressure curve that you're going to get in here. Actually, I'll look it up for you and, uh, and put it in the video. The output of an engine is dependent upon the relation between pressure and volume in the cylinders during compression, combustion and expansion. For each separate cylinder, the indicator traces a curve, the so-called PV diagram. The diagram shows that the pressure is almost equal to the scavenger air pressure when the scavenge ports are uncovered. The exhaust valve and scavenge ports are then closed. The air is compressed and when the fuel is injected and ignited, the pressure will rise rapidly and remain at maximum during continued injection. After injection, the pressure in the cylinder falls to exhaust pressure and during the exhaust period to scavenge air pressure. Scavenging, compression, combustion, expansion, exhaust, and back to scavenging. Anyway, getting back to her. Uh, well, I, I just like to, I like to show you that simple arithmetic is a very powerful tool, and numeracy is extremely important for everybody that's in a technical trade. Or back to the construzione. Now, this is an expensive part right here because here's another wiper now this is a different material this is buna n and this is an expensive part because it's actually rubber rubber is expensive it's you know, have to use natural latex and some binders and fillers and all that sort of thing but the process to manufacture it is expensive because you have to knead the raw rubber you got to put in the colorants you want you got to put the modifiers that you want then you have to put it in a mold 
and pressure vulcanize it. You can't just heat this stuff up. It won't set. You actually need to put it under pressure and heat it up and then the uh, sulfur cross links there's some sort of sulfur compound in there that cross links the rubber together and makes it solidify it never once you vulcanize rubber you can't reuse it it's it's a one time only thing it's like epoxy so the only way to recycle this is to chew it up and just use the granules in a matrix expensive part here and this is obviously the bumper yeah on the front end of this so this thing is just winging in there that's you know getting accelerated by 30 pounds and it's now if we look at the gear housing this is actually uh, a very nicely machined gear housing as well and it's polished on this inside bore where where this bumper hits and where this this guy whoop, this guy goes into as well so here we have some powdered metal parts uh, these are quite cheap. They use powder metal because it's cheap. Uh, they just put it in a mold and then pressurize, force it in the mold. And while it's under pressure, they heat it up, but not to melting. Uh, and the grains just sort of, sort of grow together over time and then you get a solid part. But the machining is minimal. This casting, this is a big aluminum casting. You see here it's uh, A380. So that is really good. It's got... A380, it's got like 10% uh, silicon in there, and that's for nucleation to make when it when it solidifies in the mold or the uh, the dye, that makes tiny tiny grains. So it it makes it very strong. Uh, 300 and 320 MPa, something like that. What's that? 40 40 kilo psi. So quite strong, and it's a big beefy piece too because the gear housing is in here as well. So this is weird here though. The, there's no fasteners other than pins. So I don't know, uh, eh, it might be a fool's errand. Just watch close here, we might have some spring of a thing in. Sprung of a thong in. I mean, just to, just to be thorough, let's have a look at the gears, make sure they're not plastique or something silly like that now just as I thought actually a nice big pinion on on that motor surprisingly large considering that the torque it has to take but powdered metal gears as you can see and then uh, each stage is roughly a quarter inch looks like and that's two inches so there's eight reductions in there, likely. Maybe seven reductions. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of reductions, eh? There's a lot of parts in here, considering the price of this. This this unit here was 200 Canadian pesos. Now, the more I look at this, you know, there's some chintzy stuff, but I would say you're getting your money's worth. As far as the magazine, most things are metal and nice springs there. Um, it feels okay. Nothing wrong with it. On the plastic, the the one you can see, <laughs> there's a brass insert. However, the one that's blind here is just plastic. So the, they're taking note of what guys are noticing, definitely, and, and putting a little bit skookum or part where guys can see it and then trying to hide the tooth here where guys can't see it. But overall, it feels okay. I mean, it slides real nice in the hand. And it's a nice positive latch on the magazine there, so eh. Right, I think we had a nice good look at the innards, uh, the mechanical side. In the next video, we're going to look at the electrical side and also do the testing. Now, having said that, I don't feel too bad about this particular tool from uh, Cryobi. Marketers, of course, have been pissing on our heads, uh, telling us it's rain for the past 60 years. But as Confucius says, it's better to be pissed off than pissed on. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice.